Good morning. Welcome as we take a look at our last set of readings here for the, the season of Advent, because as we wrap up our Advent season this week, already by Friday, we're, we're celebrating again the birth of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we pay attention to our, <coughs> our scripture text from this past Sunday, um, the epistle reading comes again from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 10. And Hebrews, as I discover time and time again, you know, I read it, but then I'm always amazed and, uh, you know, surprised along the way as we, we uh, run across it again in the lectionary. Um, how, how beautifully specific um, the, the writer is, not only to the importance of, of Christ, but then that, that balance between law and gospel and how we're saved, not by the works of the law, but again, by, by, by what Christ has done as we hear this within our, our own reading here today. Also, um, and there goes Errol, he's found a squeaky toy, so my apologies if he's, he's gonna, if he squeaks a lot here. Um, so as we listen, um, and, and it builds also on, on Luke's gospel where, yes, um, we, we hear about that visit between Elizabeth and Mary where, where John the Baptist leapt and, leapt and kicked there in Elizabeth's womb as, as um, the, the baby heard the voice of Mary, the mother of our Lord, um, speaking to him. As we hear all of these sorts of things uh, along the way, it is that reminder not only of the joy of the coming of the Incarnation, but the importance and the significance um, as, we, as we consider that here as our Lord stepped into the world, that Jesus came in order to give that perfect sacrifice of his own body and his own blood on the cross, which we continue to share in through the Lord's Supper. And something that also the writer of the book of Hebrews, you know, builds upon within the bigger picture of how he writes. But as we take a look at our, our specific reading, we'll pay attention to where he goes. As always, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, not only in Scripture, but especially for your word, your Son, the Word made flesh, who came to be born as our brother to take our brokenness upon himself. Bless us as we enter into this, this Christmas season, as we prepare to celebrate on Friday night again the birth of that, that Savior, our brother, our Lord, in the flesh, so that we would learn to see more and more that Christ came in order to meet us right into right in the depths of our own struggles, both in our hearts and our minds, but even within our bodies, in order to carry us through death and the grave. Continue to bring that light of His His Word into our lives, so that as we learn to learn to pay attention and meditate upon that gift by the working of Your Holy Spirit, that we would learn to rest in the fullness of what you have accomplished for us as we celebrate it, yes, first with the birth of our Savior, but looking forward to that time of his return again. In his name we pray and we say amen. All right, Hebrews 10. <clears throat> so when Christ came into the world, so he's very specific. He's talking about Jesus incarnation um, here and as we take a look and as we listen as the gospel reading reminds us that started not simply with the birth of Christ in in uh, Bethlehem usually that's where we do celebrate it where where he's visibly born behind that inn in the manger there but it began already while Christ was in Mary's womb and starting with the Annunciation which we always celebrate in the spring and it always falls in the middle of Lent and we kind of scratch our heads isn't that a Christmas theme well, no, because nine months before before the birth is when the conception happens, and so that's why it's always placed there much earlier in the year. But here, when Christ came into the world, he said, okay, and this is what the Lord said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. So notice where he goes. He's drawing on these Old Testament passages, and he pulls them out in, in order to show and demonstrate that all of these things were already pre-announced and prophesied about, foretold through the through not only um, David and the Psalms, but through the various prophets. And, and that's one of the marvelous gifts that we have in the book of Hebrews. Not that Paul doesn't do that or Peter doesn't do that in his own kind of a way, but the writer of the book of Hebrews, um, just like Matthew's gospel, which was written pr primarily for a Judaic um, Christian community, um, it was written in order to draw on all of these promises and to bring them to our eyes so that we can see and say, yes, yes, there it is. So here already, when Christ came into the world, 
The whole point was is that Jesus took on his body in order to have um, to, to offer that sacrifice. Um, and, and so rather than the offerings and sacrifices in the temple, which were according to the law, the Lord prepared a new body, a perfect body, the body of the Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, so that, you know, this body which was prepared for him in the Virgin Mary's womb was made in order to make that perfect sacrifice and that gift of atonement. In other words, to, to cover over and to buy back, buy us back from our sinfulness, um, which, which the sacrifices in the temple were... We can talk about our own human sacrifices, you know, not saying we're sacrificing humans in church. Don't go in that direction because then that goes into, you know, second century rumors that spread around about Christians that they eat babies because they ate the Son of God, you know, the Lord's Supper, where it was very clearly taught that, you know, this is the body and blood of Christ given and shed and distributed in with and under the bread and wine. But no, we're not going there for human sacrifices, but the sacrifices that we as humans make is what I'm trying to say, where we try to appease God by our own good works, which are never perfect, which are never entirely pure. And as a result, you know, we, we, we build up this idea that we see, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can make my way into heaven by what I do. And the reality is, is that it comes not by what we do, but by what Christ has done and what he calls us into all through that body which was prepared for him. So in verse 6, in burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. And again, that's a reference back to the sacrifices and the offerings that were continuously given and presented in the temple. These words became very important in the Old Testament context because as we hear them there, um, and, and we fall into this trap within our own thinking as well, where in the Old Testament context, people, um, you know, numerous times throughout the history of Israel, the Lord passed judgment on the, the people of Israel because they, they simply got into the habit of offering the sacrifices, thinking that, you know, based on what I've done, it's good enough without faith. Based on what I've done, you know, I'll just offer another sacrifice. It's good enough without faith. In the same way in which we... You know, in our own world, in our own day and age, so often see people stumbling and, and fall into this even within ourselves. It's like, you know, as long as I'm doing the right things and giving enough offering to the church or showing up on Sunday enough times and these sorts of things, and I'm good, but it's without faith. Wait, wait a minute. It's not based on works. Why do we go? It's not because that's a good work to present to God. Why do we give offerings and why do we offer ourselves as that reasonable sacrifice, the way Paul writes in Romans? It's not because that's a good work by which we make our way into heaven. No, we come because here is where Christ is, hidden in his word, hidden through baptism in the body of the church, hidden inside all those who have been baptized so that as we greet one another saying, the Lord be with you and also with you, we build on that cornerstone that this is the body of the church which Christ has gathered through the waters of baptism so that through members through baptism we become members of the body of Christ, the way that Paul says. And Christ is not only made alive in us through that word, through the sacrament, but then also that heartbeat of the church from the altar and the Holy Supper of our Lord where he continues to feed us with that very real gift in, with, and under the bread and wine which connects us right back to the cross perfect sacrifice, which our Lord has prepared in the body that was prepared for him. Okay, so it's not our offerings or our sense of see how good I am that makes us worthy. Christ works through us and desires to do that as we serve one another. And so and that's very much Luther's comment that the Lord doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. Um, as we hear that, it's that reminder that as we come before the Lord, we, we humble ourselves in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, confessing our sins in order to be filled, and washed, and renewed in that flood of forgiveness again and again and again. So that that then clears out, you know, the, the, the clogged drains of our lives continuously so that it flows not only into us, but through us to others. So... And it comes through the body of Christ. And that becomes an important element within, within um, biblical theology. I'm going to pause there here just before we keep going on. Um, 
what happens, and this infects us as Lutherans as well, um, where in our day and age, and, and many, many denominations, uh, Reformed and Evangelical churches, especially, um, you know, Baptist sorts of churches, they will deal with Jesus as the divine Son of God, and they will talk about how the, you know, the body of Jesus really is just, uh, you know, they, they won't say it this crassly, but there's that sense that the body of Jesus was important so that he could die on the cross, but um, after his death and resurrection, the body is basically locked up in heaven. Okay, and then that's very much an idea that came out of John Calvin. So that <clears throat> the whole idea is, is that, you know, we can have a spiritual connection with the divinity of Christ, but that the body of Christ is really no, doesn't benefit us on this, at, at this point in time. Um, th this ties and cuts right into, you know, and for those of you who want a little bit more of a deeper sort of a, a discussion in terms of theology, <coughs> it, it ties into the, the debates about who Jesus is, Christological debates, where <coughs> um, much of contemporary Protestantism falls into the trap of, of um, well, a couple of different traps, um, but but the one that I'm particular pointing to is is one called Nestorianism, where the idea is is that the the body of Jesus was a convenient um, vehicle for the divinity of Christ to do his work, and now that he's in heaven, you know that's not really as big of a concern what the body is up to. And Scripture doesn't write like that. Um, Paul doesn't write like that. Paul emphasizes the body of Christ. John, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Where the body of Christ is so important for us because it is in, with, and through the body of Christ, not only that God comes to meet us and to work our salvation, but also it's in, with, and through the body of Christ where we have access through baptism um, and the Holy Supper of our Lord that we, we too are joined with everything that Jesus does for us. So as we hear this, you know, the way that the writer of the book of Hebrews is presenting it here, it's not all of the things that we do in order to try and appease God that, you know, generates our salvation, but it's by that one work of God in Christ, in and through that incarnate, you know, Jesus in his body, so that his body becomes a necessarily necessary element that we have not only forgiveness and life and salvation, but we have hope, we have joy, we have all of those gifts given to us even now. So that as we gather, that becomes really the focus of what our, our worship life is about and our spiritual life is about, because as we participate in that, in the body of Christ, there's all those words from Scripture again, we become through that body, the way that Peter writes, partakers of the divine nature, so that we don't have access to the divinity of Christ without the body and the blood of Christ. Okay, and so I'll just pause and leave that there. You can meditate on that one and, and chew on it. It's a good one to chew on. All right, <clears throat> verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So here, this is the voice of Jesus saying, Behold, coming through the Old Testament prophets. So behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Notice it's not the sacrifices and offerings that have to be repeated, the imperfect ones, but this is something completely different. It's God's will from heaven. As we hear, it's, you know, God wills all people to be saved so that Jesus comes in order to work and open that door in his flesh through his side um, for everyone to have access to that. And, and, and when people turn away from that and say, I don't need it, that's where all of a sudden we, we raise the question, why don't you, why don't you need this Jesus? Um, why do you think that this Jesus, or do you prefer just the idea Jesus, or the spiritualized Jesus where it's just the divine Jesus of your own preferences and those sorts of things? No, the Jesus that came is a very real Jesus, a physical Jesus, um, who stepped into the messiness of, of our, even our own mortality and suffered and died. This is our God, and this is where we meet him. Okay. All right, so I, I have come to do your will, the Lord says, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Okay. And then verse 8, when he said above, you have neither desired nor take pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, 
again, quoting from the Psalms, these are offered according to the law. So again, making this distinction and saying right here, the sacrifices and the offerings which, which the Lord says he has not desired, these are the ones according to the law, which, you know, if you're just doing it to try and appease God and make yourself good enough, it's not going to work. This is not what God desires. Instead, he sent his son in order to do his will, okay? And this is where he goes. And then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. That's the voice of Christ. And then he's in the writer of the book of Hebrews says, and this is a beautiful verse, he abolishes the first, all of the works that we have to try to do to appease God. You don't get into heaven that way. Sorry, folks. It's not a Monty Python skit. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. So what's the second? It's where Christ speaking through the Old Testament prophets says, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And by that will, verse 10, we have been sanctified. Notice the word sanctified, where it has the sense of being made holy, being declared holy, but also having the sense of being justified. And so justification and sanctification are tied together as one work that comes from God in Christ, which is rooted in the work of Christ rather than in the work of what we do. But, you know, in the same way that Paul writing to the, the, first, uh, the first letter to the Corinthians, and I always love that where he starts that letter. And you know, after having read it a number of times, that this was a problem congregation and there were people messed up in all kinds of different moral ideas and opinions which go right directly against God's word, as well as, you know, the cultural issues, as well as the socio-political things where the rich people didn't want to eat the Lord's Supper, the agape meal together with the, with the servants and the slaves. And so there was all kinds of shenanigans going back and forth and then people got high and saying, I've got a better spiritual gift than you do, na, 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 all these kinds of things along the way so in order to try and push other people down and stay on top of the garbage heap, you know, all those sorts of things. And it's a good image to hold in mind because, you know, it's like kids playing in the old, in old um, you know, playgrounds where, you know, you'd have this, this constant battle of wits and egos in order to see who's got the, you know, on top of the pecking order. He writes to them with those opening words, you know, in the grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to the sanctified in our Lord Jesus Christ. He starts out by calling them sanctified. Why? It's not because of their actions and their behavior or their attitudes or their spiritual gifts. He actually tells them off for all of those sorts of things and says, you know, if you're going to talk about spiritual gifts, here's the spiritual gifts. First one is faith. No one can say that Jesus is Yahweh without the Holy Spirit. Okay? No one can confess that faith that Jesus is God in the flesh. Secondly, in terms of spiritual gifts, everyone has a spiritual gift by which we're baptized or through baptism where we serve our neighbor rather than you know, trying to say that we're better than our neighbor. And then he goes on from that end of that chapter 12 into chapter 13, where he reminds us that, you know, faith looks like love in action and it looks like faith hope and love rather than you know blathering on in tongues and languages that that nobody understands which you think that you know comes from heaven you know I'm not saying it can't happen but at the same time he says that's the least among the gifts and really isn't worth worth bringing into the public sphere because unless you've got a real interpreter of that and of course the answer is well who's interpreting it okay i'm, I'm not sure um but nowadays you get people that will say well well you know, I've got that gift in interpretation, and I'll tell you. That's why Paul reminds us, saying that, you know, the, the spirit of the prophets is under the control of the prophets. And so even there, you know, the prophets don't just blurt out, and they don't just go on and on and on like a foghorn, you know, gong going on and on and on. It's always there in the sense of building up the body and edifying the body. And by doing that, he really collapses that whole um, egoistic sense of, of spiritual gifts that so often can creep into um, congregations of any sort, of any sort. But here, as we listen to that, faith, hope, and love. So here, as we look at all of these things, and as we listen again, when we hear that verse, verse 10, and by that we have been sanctified, 
Okay, same as Paul wrote. Um, sanctified in God, even though they're still wrestling with their sins. Paul never separates those two realities from one another because throughout his writings, he reminds people that throughout our lives, we will continue to struggle with our brokenness. But we build on the perfect gift, the perfect sacrifice. And this is what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying. The sacrifices of the temple done in order to appease God, God doesn't desire because it's imperfect. But instead, Christ, speaking through the Old Testament prophet, says, I have come to do your will, O God. And it's by that work. So we have law and gospel by the work of Christ, by Christ doing God's will, that we have not only been sacrificed, or sacrificed with Christ. There's the baptismal connection too, the, the way that Paul writes, baptized into the death of Christ. We're baptized into his death. We die with him through baptism. But more than that, we have been raised, and here he says we have been sanctified through the offering of the body. Notice it's not through the divinity or through you know, all these sorts of things. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And again, the importance of the body. I know that many evangelical churches will, will take a look at John chapter 6 and they will try to diffuse it from, from um, you know, a sacramental sense where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, or, yeah, and drink my blood you have no life in you. Um, and then they, there's that one verse, uh, the flesh is of no avail. As we read through that, and as we set it next to the rest of Scripture, that verse um, in John's Gospel points to the fleshly way of looking at things, where the, the Pharisees who were offended at Jesus' words um, tried to build on their own sense of what makes sense. And that really puts it into the same context of the sacrifices and burnt offerings, which don't get you anywhere. Um, but Jesus' words are spirit and truth, spirit and life and when jesus says those words in john's gospel as well he doesn't back away from the sense that he means eating and drinking because he moves from the polite sense of the word eating and drinking to the more aggressive ravenous word for eating and drinking in order to drive it home in the same way here we're reminded through this writer of the book of hebrews that the body of christ is the place where the work of God takes place. And it's so it's through the body of Jesus Christ, not only that he dies and rises again, but that we have that connection through baptism into the body of Christ, where we die with him and we are raised with him. So that as we hear this passage, as short as it is, and we tie it together with this Advent, hope and anticipation for this fourth week where we remember that as we celebrate this Advent and Christmas season, you know, remembering and reflecting more deeply on the reality that God stepped into our world in that flesh in order to do that work and to do that will of our God in order to save us, that we have, even here, in and through that body, that same access as we receive and encounter our Savior sacramentally in and through the church, constituted in baptism, even with the people with all of their mistakes and foibles, just like you and me, um, we're sanctified by what Christ has done, which is why as we gather together, really we're called upon not only to confess our sins and to forgive one another, but in order to hold on to that forgiveness that comes to us in and through that body of Christ as well. So, again, um, beautiful reflection here as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem in that manger on this Friday evening. May the Lord strengthen you in that faith um, for all of our you know, church members don't overlook and underestimate the gift of the Lord's Supper. Um, and then for all of those of you who are listening from elsewhere and perhaps from outside of the, the church community, if you're here locally, 
do get in touch with us into the next year. I'll be taking a couple of weeks of a break um, from, you know, just to lay low after Christmas. Pastor Oboya, our, our assistant pastor, is going to be leading the services on those days. But at the same time, you know, do reach out, contact us. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, we'll find a way to, to, to you know, build, build his church. Not, not my church, his church. Um, by bringing more and more people into contact with that Savior as he comes to us in his word and the sacraments even today. The Lord be with you. May he give you his peace. Amen.